All right, so I will introduce myself. My name is Reagan Lipinski, and I am the training director for Marine Sonic Technology. We are a manufacturer of side scan sonar systems, and I go around and I teach people how to use them. I have about 20 years in law enforcement, both uh, military, local, and federal level, and a majority of that work is was in the Marine side of things. And so I ran a police Marine unit and dive teams and we did a ton of searches. So that's kind of what got me into this. The Marine Sonic's main niche is uh, police, fire, and military and uh, documenting evidence, IEDs, things like that. And of course, uh, victim recovery. So if you are here uh, for anything outside of police and fire or first responder, just know that all of this will still apply to whatever you're searching for, whether it's uh, salvage, or uh, shipwreck hunting, treasure hunting, uh, looking at dams, things like that. Whatever uh, your task is, this will still apply. But the verbiage that I will be using today uh, will mostly be geared toward first responders. So if there are some things, some verbiage that you don't understand, just uh, let me know and I can clarify and probably uh, tie it into however you're using the system. Today, we will be going over the basic search techniques and how to uh, use your sonar in a searching method uh, to help find your targets. You know, you, you got it. The main reason people use this thing is to uh, go out and find things, right? Um, whether they be known or unknown. So let's let's get into it. We're gonna we're gonna start off uh, with a couple of topics. So these are the topics we're gonna discuss today. Uh, we're gonna go over uh, gathering intelligence. And gathering intelligence is pretty important. You gotta know what it is you're looking for in order to set up a good search area. So then we're gonna talk about planning our search, what search areas are, how to use them, how to divide them, and how to set them up in priorities. Uh, we'll talk about uh, different types of search patterns. Um, how do you actually move through the water in order to uh, conduct that search? Uh, another key one is pre-search. Uh, this is the one people skip and it's why they damage their toe fish. So we'll get into uh, pre-searching and uh, what that means and how that works. A little bit into marking targets. How do we mark a target so we can find it later? And then we'll talk about searching outside the box. How do we use the system in an area that's not suitable for topish. We'll, we'll get into all of that here today. Hopefully we will be a little less than two hours. Uh, I'll try and keep it right around that two hour mark. Um, this will be recorded and um, we'll post a link uh, probably early next week so you can uh, pass it along. All right, so we're gonna start off with gathering intelligence. The uh, intel gathered will determine how you conduct your search. Um, you need to know some basic information um, about what you're searching for uh, so you can set up your system to image that properly. Um, and if you haven't seen our first video on the basics of side scan, please go check that out. Um, and it'll teach you how to set up your system in order to image different types of targets and things like that. So in the Intel gathering, there's a couple of things you need to uh, start writing down and, 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 and putting into one location so, so it'll help you out. First, the thing is, what is your target? What are you looking for? Size, weight, dimensions, uh, height, width, what the material it's made out of. Is there any buoyancy with it? Is it gonna float? Is it gonna sink? Is it gonna like uh, go in midwater with neutral buoyancy um, and float with the current? All of this um, needs to be known before you begin your search. You kind of want to start out with what is your target, what you're looking for. Gather up the last known location. A lot of the times that might not be known, um, but get as close as you can to the last known location um, of your target. When was it lost? What is the time frame? Okay, are you starting the search immediately after that target was lost? or are you starting it a few days later? That will affect where the target is and how you conduct that search. What type of seafloor is it? I know that might not sound um, like it needs to be known, but uh, depending on the type of seafloor uh, will help you out in determining whether or not your 
target is going to be above the seafloor or below the seafloor. A lot of us work in very silty environments uh, where it's a very spongy uh, bottom. And if you have a heavy, small object, it can very easily sink below um, that seafloor. You want to know what that seafloor is like. Is it rocky? Is it rugged? Are there uh, big structures there like trees and rocks and things like that? Are there going to be obstructions that you're going to run into? Are there, does it go from really shallow to really deep? Uh, things like that. Just uh, kind of get a good sense of where you're at. And you can ask around, ask people that are that are uh, local to that area to, to get a feel of what that seafloor is like. You're also gonna wanna know weather conditions and tidal conditions and current conditions. What has happened to the environment from the time you lost your target to the time you begin to search for your target? The current wind and weather will play a big role in how that anomaly or how your target will move around. Um, and where it ultimately will land. Get to know, again, the size and the shape of your object. Your size and shape and material uh, will determine your range and frequency. And you have to figure all of that out prior to beginning the search. And it, does your target have any buoyancy? Will it gain or lose buoyancy? The topography of the bottom, and are there any witnesses um, to the event? That's the, you, Again, you want to gain as much information about your target as possible. All right, so the target. For those who don't know and aren't first responders, what we're looking at here in the image is the um, image of a victim. And so this is going to be a drowned victim, and that's what most first responders are uh, searching for uh, using a side scan sonar system. So that's why we are using this as an image. Uh, but you can. Uh, Think about it as a ship or a car or a plane or a treasure. Whatever your target is, you're gonna need to gather some information about it. First is dimensions. What is the height, width, and area of that target? That's going to help you assist in selecting a frequency, and the frequency is gonna determine how much resolution uh, you are gonna get into that target. Um, and it's also gonna help you set the range. If you remember from the first episode, we talked about the rule of thumb. And so different from the rule of thumb you're thinking, but the rule of thumb in side scan is you want the image on your screen to be about the size of your thumb. Uh, we explained that in depth in the first video, so go back and check that out. Um, and that will help you in setting your range. Um, the range is how you're going to be able to see the details of your target on the screen. Uh, what is the weight? The weight's gonna help you determine, one, how fast it sunk, right? Did it sink into the silt? Is it resting on something else? Does it have uh, buoyancy where it's going to float for a while and then sink? Or is it going to be where it sinks and then putrefies and then gains buoyancy and floats? So. You're gonna to wanna to know all of this. Is the buoyancy going to change in that target over a period of time? Eventually, we'll get to a video on how uh, bodies decay, and we will talk about the, uh, how a body will sink, and then putrefy, and then float, and then resink. And so that time frame and how all, all of that works, we'll talk about in a separate video. Another thing is, will the object move? Will your target move? When it comes to bodies, that's a yes and a no question. It's uh, when the body begins to float, of course, it's going to move before it resinks. But as the body sinks the first time, there's not going to be a whole lot of movement there. Typical humans sink at about seven and a half feet per second in the water they are in. And yes, current will affect that, but the, that rate of descent is, is pretty rapid. And so you can think of most objects will be in a radius of the depth of the water they're in. So if the depth of the water is 30 feet, most likely they will be found within a 30 foot radius of where they sunk. Then once it, that object hits the ground, most of the time it's not likely to move around. It's usually going to sit right where it landed, unless it has some type of buoyancy to it. Um, and when I say buoyancy, I'm not talking about it's just kind of uh, 
upright, right? If there's friction dragging across the ground, it's not going to move a whole lot unless you have a very heavy current, unless you have a little bit of buoyancy where it's going to either bounce or it's going to float midwater. If it's floating midwater, it's, it's going to move around and there's not a whole lot we can do about that. What, what is the material of the structure? Um, that's going to determine how uh, it lands and how it moves with the actual ground itself. Um, and you are going to want to know that mainly for the return of the frequency, what is your object going to look like when you actually see it? And then, of course, uh, the last on our list is the last known location. Um, you can get this several ways. Main way is uh, who reported it to you, right? The person that reported it probably saw it happen and can point, that's where it happened. Uh, but we all know witness accounts, they're not entirely accurate, and especially when you're out on the water and you have water all around you, it's hard to say it went down right here. They may think they know, but we're going to be uh, kind of a guessing game. So you want to get multiple witness accounts if you can, and then have each person kind of point in a direction and you're going to cross reference and and get a last known location. Another way is if you can ping a cell phone, if uh, somebody on that vessel or the person in the water had a cell phone, uh, you can track that cell phone uh, by its ping rate. So as it's sending out signals to cell towers, you can triangulate through cell towers and actually get its location. If you can find the vessel the person was on, um, you can also get a track record from the vessel itself on its GPS location. All right, now we're going to talk about water movement and weather. All right, this is where we start getting into where and how these targets are going to move around. Because if a target hits the water and it doesn't sink directly, um, and it is moving around, there are things that are going to affect it. And the size of the object, will determine how much wind can hit it and that surface area there is going to act as a sail and be able to push it uh, versus the surface area under the water and then you have current pushing against it and so the surface area the size of the object will tell you how far that object can move versus the wind and the current that are pushing against it um, as you can see in some of these pictures, you can see a current movement. And we're looking at the upper left-hand corner picture, this very first picture that my mouse is moving on now. Um, you can go online and get current charts uh, for the water that you're on. Current charts will show you the, the magnitude of movement of the water and how that water moves throughout the, the body and land masses that it's around. And you can see if there's any pinch points that that water will speed up or when it widens out, it will slow down. Think about it also as, as like in a pool. If you have a pool and a filter circulating that pool, it's gonna be going around in, in a circle. And where is that water moving the fastest, right? So in a pool, it's gonna be moving around that outer edge and the inner edge is, or the inner, portion of the pool isn't going to have a whole lot of water movement and so things can sink. When you're looking at different uh, areas that you're going to be searching, figure out where that water is going to move and where it's going to be still. It's going to move faster in some areas and slower in others. When that water movement slows enough for the descent of the object, the object will hit the ground and it will become to a rest. We can also see down here um, in the lower right-hand corner, there's a GIF that is moving That's on wind currents. You also need to find out what wind happened in your area uh, between the time you lost the target to the time you found the target. There are wind charts out there um, available for most areas, and usually you can uh, pick them up from your local weather station. So you'll see in these wind charts, you're going to have these uh, brighter red areas in these oranger areas. Um, that's the, the higher wind movements uh, versus the lower wind movements. And did you have enough wind 
that it's going to move your object around before it sank. So these, when we get in a little bit later, we're gonna be talking about set and drift, and these will help you to determine where that, again, that object went down. Another way to do it is called the rubber ducky method. The rubber ducky method is, a, I know it's kind of a funny term, but it's the way the Coast Guard conducts their search. Uh, they have these little objects that have GPS locators on them. Um, and these little teeny tiny buoys, they throw them in the water, massive amounts of them at a time. Um, and then they float around. They float with wind and current and they will move around and they can track them on GPS. When they track them, they can see where a majority of them group, right? Because some will, will go with the softer current, some will go with the higher current, some will be affected by wind. But when they hit that slow or non-moving water is where they're going to gather. Where a majority of those little indicators gather um, is where they normally begin their search. And so if you look at the lower left-hand picture, um, you can see the brighter shades of red is where more of those rubber duckies gathered than the other places. So the blues and the grays are the uh, least amount uh, of those rubber duckies that were gathered. Well, how can you create a rubber ducky for yourself? You don't have to use um, a GPS locator. You can basically place a floating object in the water that is half submerged and half in the air and allow that buoy to move uh, freely. And so you're going to collect its GPS coordinate as soon as you put it in the water and then let it go. And an hour later, find it again get its GPS coordinate. And then you can see the difference between where you dropped it and where it ended up. And you can calculate a trajectory, okay? And where it moved in that hour, um, you can then calculate how many hours it's been since your target was lost until the beginning of your search. And you can kind of get a trajectory, where tra trajectory of where that object could be moving to. And again, that's if your object is floating or has some buoyancy to it. It's quite likely that when a person goes into the water, they survive at the surface for a little while before they eventually drown and sink. Same with boats and cars. When a boat and a car goes in, uh, sometimes they will float before the air is released and then they sink. So it is nice to, to find one, your, your last, known, uh, last known location, and then the trajectory of the rubber ducky and so you can follow that path in order to um, conduct your preliminary search. All right so let's get into set and drift. What is set and drift? Um, if you are a sailor a lot of people know uh, what set and drift already is because you use it for navigation but you can also use set and drift calculations to help locate your lost object. And so we're going to start off looking at this um, diagram here on the left. You have the blue line here, which is your water course, okay? That is the course you set with a compass, and you're, you want to go from one location to another location. So you're in your boat, you set your course, you have your bearing, um, and you're following that path, right? And we're going to call that, uh, just for the sake of argument, zero degrees true. Okay, so if we're following the path zero degrees true, and we had no wind and no water movement, um, the boat would follow that course in a straight line. But we all know with all the wind and water movement um, that is going on, especially in open water, we don't and we can't follow a straight line. You have things like the current moving in one direction, the wind moving in another direction that is pushing on that boat and causing it to move. So you'll see the second line, you'll see my mouse moving on, and that is your ground track. That is the actual movement of the boat moving through water. So you can see our boat is still has a bearing of zero zero uh, degrees true, but because the current is pushing against it, it is moving forward at zero zero degrees true, but it is moving off of that water track. And we call that the ground track. That's the actual movement of the boat physically through the water. In a set and drift uh, calculation for sailing, for navigation, um, you're trying to find the current 
in that, okay? Um, so you take your calculation of where your, your bearing was, that water track, and then you see your ground track and its bearing, and then you can measure the distance from where you wanted to be versus where you are now, and you can calculate the, the current movement going across. With body movements or uh, target movements, we're, we're going to be looking at that a little different. On this diagram on the right, we know our wind and we can know our current, right? We figured that out by um, watching the Weather Channel and Googling our current for the day or testing the current and wind using our rubber ducky method. And from that, we can calculate um, the actual ground track, okay? And that ground track is gonna be a rough estimate, but at least it will give you a direction of travel. And so if you have a last known location and you can calculate how fast that wind is moving versus how fast that current is moving, you can get kind of a rough estimate of where that object could be in the future. I hope that makes sense. We'll probably get in into calculating set and drift in a different video if, uh, if people are confused about that. But there, there's a ton of information on how to calculate set and drift and how to get that wind in current condition so we can calculate those. All right, so now how do we set up search areas? We're gonna talk about how to set up search areas and how to prioritize them. And that makes a lot of sense when you're looking at big, huge areas of water. One of the biggest mistakes people do is they go out in these big, large areas of water and they try and search it all at one time one big giant search area going back and forth and trying to cover it all at one time. And then they're fighting lifting the towfish and dropping the towfish because the, the curvature of the bottom is going up and going down. Then they're hitting objects because they didn't know the objects were there. And it can be very, very cumbersome. So how do we set up different search areas and how do we prioritize them for our search? All right, so we're gonna start off looking at this map. And if we look at it, we can see our depth calculations and our depth calculations here are going to assist us for our primary search patterns or search areas. We're going to break this area up into multiple search areas. And you can see on here, we have the contour lines, right? And then we have these large areas of open water. And how would we search this area? How do we break this apart um, into different areas of search so we're not fighting our towfish? Okay, because again, if you're to create a bearing, and my mouse keeps disappearing, um, but if you create a bearing straight across here, right, and this was our search area, okay, if we were to move across this area, we would have to lift our towfish over these points and then lower our towfish back down into this area lifting it again and then dropping it again okay a lot of the times the water that you're running in is going to be a crazy dynamics crazy seafloor dynamics and you're going to get really tired or you're going to wear out your crew lifting and dropping that towfish um, so we can break this area up by depth um, in different types of searches for different areas of this map. All right, so the first one we'll talk about is we would probably break this area off here. So we would create, let's see if I have a little annotation mark. All right. So we could break a search area off here. we would probably have another search area here. And another search area here. And probably another one encompassing out here. So you're going to break all of these areas up 
into individual search areas. Instead of trying to do this all at one time, that way we can kind of set our toe fish and forget about it. And we can just monitor uh, our screen so we can visualize instead of worrying about lifting and lowering that toe fish, let's, let's get it set to a specific height and then we'll monitor and watch for anomalies coming down. All right, so here's a, a common area that uh, most people will, will be uh, familiar with to their areas of operation. It's a small port type area. Uh, we have uh, some little legs in here, uh, some dockage areas and things like that. Um, open to free water at the bottom and as a vessel would move in here, how would we be able to break this area up into different searches and how are we going to prioritize each one of these different areas? Um, so we can kind of see this area here matches up, this area here does. We can have a track line search along the shorelines and we would break up areas here. Let's see what that looks like. All right, so these are some different search areas that we would initiate. This, what, or this yellow dot here is going to indicate our, our target and where it sunk, okay? So that's our, our last known location of, the, of whatever target we want it to be, whether it's a body, a ship, um, car, whatever. Um, so that's our last known location. So we wanna kind of set up our first search, uh, search area right where that object would be, okay? And why have we shifted it a little up and off to the side? Well, we're calculating in for tidal and wind um, in that movement. And so that would be our first search area. Our second one would be off here because if our, if our uh, current is moving up and our wind is moving across, um, it's going to force that water movement into uh, this little leg here. And so that's why we would search that area next. Uh, third, we would come back out and search again our, where our last known was before we would search number four. Let's see, do we have a question here? Be sure to know what your chart is marked with in depth. They can be in feet, fathoms, or meters. U.S. freshwaters, June. Yes, yeah, so of course, make sure uh, what your depths are uh, on the particular chart you're using. Uh, most people, when they're using their charts, uh, they have it set up for the depths that they're used to. All right, so again, you wanna break up your search areas into multiple different locations. You do not wanna try and set up one big giant search area. Um, it, it just doesn't work out. Um, so you can prioritize each one of these search areas or break them up and give them to uh, multiple different teams or multiple different teams with different sonars. Um, as in the side scan for, for deeper water and hull mounted for shallower water, uh, sector scan for, for enclosed areas and things like that. Uh, you'll see also here this blue line, that's indicated as a track line search. And we're gonna go over that, uh, what a track line search is here in a little bit, um, along with how do we search these different search areas. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple of different types of search patterns for that. So with your search area, again, you're gonna start off with your target. You're going to calculate the wind movement, how uh, you think that uh, object moves through the water, and then where you expect it to be. You're gonna prioritize those different areas. Then you're going to set up your search grids. Once you've set up your search grids, you're going to decide what type of search pattern will benefit each area the best. All right, so now we're going to get into pre-searching. 
Pre-searching is kind of what everybody skips. Uh, most people don't do this step. They think they know the water they're in. They go out and they conduct a search uh, based on the size of their object. Um, and if you're, again, searching for bodies or something that is small, your range is going to be very small. And if your range is small, that means your towfish is going to be closer to the bottom, and which is gonna make you susceptible to knocking into things that you don't know are there. Rocks, boulders, trees, uh, entanglements, the shipwreck itself, uh, things like that. So we need to mark where these objects are and at least try and find where they are and mark them uh, so we can move around them uh, when we're actually conducting our search. And so we do this by what's called pre-searching. And your pre-search is uh, you're going to take your towfish and you're going to set it out at a pretty far range, usually a, a range where your swath is going to cover your entire search area. And when you do that, that will allow your towfish to be higher in the water so you're not as low to the ground, so you're not going to run into these obstructions. You'll make one or two passes over your search area, and then you can see these large obstructions and you can mark them. If you mark the large obstructions that are in the water, then you can move around them instead of hitting them with your towfish. Uh, especially when you're moving into shallower water, if you're trying to see into shore where your towfish is gonna be really high, or you're again looking for a smaller object and your towfish is going to be really low. So a, again, a pre-search is a very wide range where your towfish is really high in the water and you are looking for large objects. You're looking for objects that are tall and high off the ground that are gonna interfere with your search. I can't stress enough, do not skip this portion. Uh, a lot of people like to cut corners and they don't get into this pre-search and then I get a call about uh, somebody ripping off their tail fin or uh, they got their towfish hung up and they had to send a diver down to, to untangle it or they nicked their cable on, on some kind of underwater cable or they got their towfish trapped on a rock or broke a transducer and all of this. And it could have very easily been uh, circumvented if they had just done a preliminary search. And you want to do this, uh, especially in, in water that you've never been in before, okay? If it's a, an area that you uh, search uh, for training or you're primarily in it all the time and you know where those uh, uh, shipwrecks are and you know where the boulders are and things like that, you may be able to get around doing a pre preliminary search. Uh, but if it's a, a body of water that you've never been in before, you really, really want to do a preliminary search. And again, I'm going to stress this uh, a, a thousand times during this. It's going to be at a very wide range in a very high depth. So you're not uh, hitting those, those objects. And you want to mark where those objects are um, electronically and probably mechanically as well. Uh, so you can avoid them during your actual low criminal search. All right, so let's talk about different types of search patterns. So different types of search patterns. The main one we're gonna talk about is the parallel grid search. Everybody's heard that, it's called mowing the lawn, right? And so um, that will be the main one that you use and we'll go in depth into detail on how to do a parallel search today. Some uh, search patterns that you may not be aware of is uh, one is called the expanding square. That's where you're going to move out and around in a location and you're going to expand out further and further. The expanding square isn't used too often, but it, it does have its traits and it can be used uh, in certain locations where the parallel grid search uh, would make uh, a whole lot of sense. Next, we're going to talk about the sector search. The sector search is typically used in an area after you found your anomaly and you need to gather more details about the area that, that it's in. And we'll talk about that when we get to it. Uh, track line is down at the bottom and you'll see that. And that is basically skirting around an object, usually land or some type of object that's in the water uh, that your vessel can't move through. And so you, you we do what's called a track line search where we're following uh, the path of that land. All right, so here's how we're gonna begin our parallel search, okay? And so 
you, you start off with your last known location. If you see my mouse, we have that yellow dot. That's our, our last known location of our object. It's where all the witnesses pointed to, or it could be just where you presumed it to be, but it's going to be the middle of your first search area. And then we're going to create a search pattern, right, around that object. And we're gonna use that object or that mark as our center point uh, for our first search area. Then we can see uh, here our vessel is, it's moving across and it is doing a pre search um, as it moves across our search area. And so when you are moving out to each search area, uh, you want to move completely across it. So you'll see our, our, our boat left from dock here and it is going to move across our search area before we actually get into our, our, um, our parallel search pattern. And as we're moving across, we want to have a very wide range that'll give us a swath that covers our search area as we move. And when we do that, make sure you mark the obstructions and so you can see them on your chart plotter. And the spacing for that parallel search will be based on the size of your target. And of course that will be determined or your size of your target will determine your frequency. Your frequency will determine your range, and we're going to follow all of those rules that we, that we talked about in our first video. So just to uh, go over those real quickly again, uh, you're going to start off with what is your target, and then your target's going to determine your frequency. How much resolution um, do you need of that target? Then your frequency, will, your frequency and the size of your target will determine your range. How big of a range can you get where your target is the size of your thumb on your computer screen? Um, so that will give us our range. Your range, again, is one side of that towfish. Swath is both sides of the towfish, both port and starboard. But when we're looking at the legs or these, the distance between legs that are traveled here, we need to set that up so our range covers one full side of that. Our swath will cover both or two legs at a time. And we can kind of see that here. So we're gonna look at this upper left hand image first, and that is our vessel moving across, beginning our first leg of our search. And as it's moving across, uh, say we're looking for a body. So if, if we're looking for a body, the, the best range is right around 65 feet. Um, so 65 feet um, on both sides, that's 130 foot of swath. And so the distance from one leg to the other needs to be covered by one side of your range. Um, so again, if we are using that, that method where we need to cover both sides and we're at 65 feet of range. Your next leg is going to be approximately 65 feet away to a point. So now we got to talk about nadir because we, we have to also cover our nadir from our last track. Um, if you remember from our first video, we uh, went extensively into nadir and what it is and why it's there. Um, so I won't uh, cover that completely, but I, what I want to cover. Um, here with you is the distance that you are missing below your boat. Um, again, as we talked about in the first video, we went over the myth that this entire black area um, is missing below your boat. That is actually a representation of the height of the towfish, not the area you're missing. And so how do we calculate the area that we're missing? Well, if we have our range, if we look at the, our little boat diagram down here, we have our range. If that is 100 feet, of range looking out. That means our towfish is going to be 10 feet off the bottom. And we are looking at a 10 degree down angle. And so if we are 10 feet off the bottom of a hundred foot of range, that means we will be missing one foot below the vessel on one side of our range. So swath, it'll be two feet. So at 65 feet of range, moving across. We are going to be at six and a half feet above the seafloor. 
which means we will be missing six and a half inches down here at the bottom. So six and a half inches of our port range plus six and a half inches of our starboard range means we'll be missing one foot. Uh, well, how do we cover that um, when we are doing our search pattern? We need to make sure that we cover that and we do that through what's called overlapping. And so you want about a 10% overlap of your last pass. And so we can kind of see that in our lower right hand corner image we can see that we are overlapping slightly our last pass. And so, of course, when we're moving and we turn around, our green is gonna be over green and we turn around and our red will be over red and that is doubly visualizing each pass. But the overlapping that I'm talking about is when you're overlapping that nadir. So if your range is 65 feet, right, we're looking 65 feet off to this side. Um, our leg spacing should probably be 60 feet, okay, giving you a five foot overlap, okay, and in that five foot overlap, and you can rough estimate about a 10% overlap, so if you want 65 feet, six and a half feet uh, would be that that exact 10%, but roughly a five foot overlap on that would be fine. It just to cover the area we've missed in the nadir. And so our next pass, our next leg of our journey would again be another 60 feet um, with a 65 foot range. We're going to move back and forth across. And as we're moving back and forth, you're gonna have green over green and red over red. And of course, the green, and, the green and red is your range. If you don't have a system that uh, covers that, you're gonna have to calculate it, okay? Most uh, professional grade uh, sonar systems should have some type of history behind it and show you to scale uh, what area you've covered. Um, if your side scan does not have that, uh, you can build that into your chart. It'll take a little bit of time, um, but you, you kind of want to do that so you can see what area you've actually covered physically, okay? When you're out looking on the water, it's very, very difficult to look out and say, yeah, we already covered that area, right? No land around, boats moving back and forth with the wind and current. How else are you going to be able to tell whether or not you've covered an area? And so you want to make sure that the system you have will display that um, and so, so you're not uh, missing any areas. Um, if you have a missed area, they call that a data holiday, where you, you've went around an area and you're not actually seeing it in it and it's being missed. Um, so again, parallel, back and forth, we call it mowing the lawn. Why do we call it mowing the lawn? Uh, because when you actually mow your lawn, normally when you turn around, you cover, right? You move your your lawnmower over the, the, the edge of the last pass that you covered, and you go back and forth down your lawn, right? You wanna make sure that you mow where your tires rolled on the last pass, so you cover, so you can cut that portion of your lawn as well. And so that's why it's called mowing the lawn. Uh, but you're gonna go back and forth, and when you are done, you'll do another uh, pre-search as you're leaving going to your next search area. All right, our next search we're gonna be talking about is the track line search. And the track line search is what you're going to be doing around bridges, dams, piers, land, um, large buoys, uh, things like that. But basically you're going to be moving uh, your vessel in line in parallel to um, any object that's in the water. Um, and if we go back to this, we can see that our search areas won't necessarily cover some of the area of water. And so that area of water, we can't really get our towfish into to create a, a parallel search pattern within here, right? And so since we can't create a parallel search pattern in there, we're gonna have to do a track line search. And that's where we're just going to follow 
the contour of the land and come back out. And so that's what this blue line represents. And you can do, you can break up these track line searches however you would like. What I typically do is I will start off with my priority one search. And then if we move to this priority two search, I will do the track line search that is closest to that priority two search. Then when we move back here to priority three, I will then do the track line next to priority three. Then we move over here to priority four. And then as we are moving towards priority four, we're gonna do again our preliminary search, uh, crossing over, and then we can do a track line on one, begin our dog leg, and then after our legs are out, we can do a track line search of the other side. So you want to make sure that all of your track line gets covered. Um, you can also have a dedicated vessel, uh, particularly for track line searches. So a, that is a track line search is a good use of your hull mounted systems. And so if you have deeper water that you're using your tow fish in and you have another vessel that has a uh, hull mounted that can't assist you with deeper water, um, you can use that hull mounted system to do your track line search. Track line searches are usually in, in a, a shallower area. Um, so you have to be pretty careful with your tow fish when you get into them. Another thing uh, you're gonna be using your track line search for is what's called vertical imaging. Vertical imaging is when you're looking at the seawall itself or you're looking underneath a finger pier or a wharf because uh, your body could have sunk and then refloated and is now underneath um, a, a dock, a pier, a wharf, uh, what, whatever object is there. Um, most toad systems will have the ability to turn um, where you're taking the tow fish itself, and if we're looking at it, uh, we can turn that tow fish so we're now visualizing the side instead of down. And when you do that, you will get what's called vertical imaging. And so these two images that are here, these are called, again, vertical images, and we are looking up and down rather than across, okay? And a track line search will, will allow you to visualize these objects so you can see what they are from the water line to the sea floor. So we can take a look at those. All right, next we have the expanding square. All right, so the expanding square, um, again, if you're not really gonna use this one too often. Um, you're going to primarily use your parallel search pattern. Um, but again, picture it as mowing the lawn. When you're mowing your lawn, you can't always just go back and forth, right? Occasionally, you have a small patch of your yard that you just can't do that with, and you're going to have to kind of move in. And I typically start going around in a square shape on those areas. And so smaller areas, tight areas, or areas surrounded by three sides, um, like if you have a wharf with two uh, piers coming off of it, I will do an expanding square in there instead of a parallel search pattern. Um, and how you do that is you'll just go to the center of, of that area and you'll move and then make 90 degree turns as you're coming out, actually. Like this. The problem with the expanding square and the main reason uh, we we try and switch people over to the parallel search pattern is because your coxswain's going to get lazy and he's going to start going around in a circle. And when you start going around in a circle, you're going to mess up your imaging. Okay, side scan needs straight lines. Okay, if you start moving in a circle, um, one side of your side scan will be compressed and the other side will be stretched. Um, and so the imaging won't be clear and you won't uh, get a good data set of points of your object. And so you, you could very easily miss your target or uh, any anomaly in the area uh, because it's either stretched or compressed to the point you can't recognize what it is. Uh, so make sure that if you do choose to use the expanding square that you keep 
it all in a straight line as you are moving around? Will there be a significant nadir with vertical imaging? All right, let's step back to vertical imaging since we have that question. All right, so with vertical imaging, um, you need to work out your nadir so it is not affecting your actual vertical image. And when I do my vertical images, what I'll, I'll typically do is set my, my toe fish at the top of the water. Because remember, uh, with nadir, it's the height of the toe fish off the bottom, right? And so that nadir, that spread is, is a representation of that height. Well, if your toe fish is turned, right? Now it is not the height off the bottom, it is the distance off the side, because we're now looking here. And so that distance is still relative, it's just now off to the side instead of up off the bottom. So if my, my boat is at the top of the water, I will keep my toe fish pretty high up and I will keep, have my nadir at the water line. And I will just set the depth of the water. Probably my range will be a little bit greater than the depth of the water. Um, and so I can look down the face of the object. You can also, um, have your toe fish at the bottom of the object in looking up. But you're going to turn off one side um, of your toe fish and you're just going to use one range instead of your swat. If you use uh, both ranges and you have your toe fish in the middle, you're going to have a nadir going right down the middle of uh, your object or, or your seawall. Um, and so it, it kind of dis uh, distracts you from, from what uh, you're actually seeing. Most of the time, a, a seawall uh, will be within the range limitations of your frequency. Um, and so if you're even using, say, something as high as 1800, if you're using 1800, you could very easily look uh, 60, 70 feet uh, of range. And so uh, if you have a 60 or 70 foot seawall, you can still turn it, keep your toe fish at the top, and you're looking down um, and keeping that nadir at the very top of your object. Um, I hope that helps. Um, just make sure that you can turn your toe fish as close to 90 degrees off of the wall as you can. Instead of looking down, you're looking across. Oop, too far. I think this is where we ended. All right, so we, we talked a little bit about the expanding square. Um, and just remember that when you're doing the expanding square, make sure you have those 90 degree corners um, and you are still doing your overlap. You want about a 10% overlap. Um, so again, if, you're, if your range is at 65 feet, um, then your legs will be at about 60 feet of spacing. Um, you are going to, instead of green over green, like you are on the parallel search, you're actually going to have green over red on this one. Um, but So the expanding square will give you a little bit more coverage um, of different angles of the object than the parallel search does. If we go back to parallel search, we can see that if our object was here, right, um, when we covered it, we would see it on our starboard side first and then when we turned around we would see it from our starboard side again but you're looking at the other side of the object right so even though you're seeing it both on your starboard side you're seeing one side versus the other side so that object is going to look different right um, so when you mark it and then you see one side and see the other, don't think it's, it's a different object. If it's in that same relative location, um, it's probably the same anomaly you marked before, um, and so, but you need to go ahead and mark it again. We'll talk about marking targets here in a little bit, um, but you're seeing it from two sides. When we are talking about the expanding square, you're going to see it again from two sides, but now you're using two different uh, transducers to view it. 
And you may think that each transducer is equal, right? Your 1800 on your port is the same as your 1800 on your starboard. And when you bought it from the factory, that is true, okay? But over time, those frequencies will slightly change, especially if you bang it on a rock and you dumped it around in the back of a pickup truck or things like that. That transducer, and we talked about what the transducer was made of in the last video, but if you get a small hairline fracture in, in your transducer, it can change the imaging slightly on each, on each frequency. And so with um, <clears throat> the expanding square, you'll get the ability to see it under two different uh, transducers. And so it may change the appearance of the object. So just be advised of that. But again, each time you see that anomaly, go ahead and set down an electronic mark, double click on it and mark it. All right, so uh, next is the sector search. Um, I always get some confusing looks on the, on the sector search. Um, because most people don't get as in depth with their search area as I would like them to. They don't believe they're going to need the information later on, but it only takes one case for, for this to, to go all awry. So if this is a criminal case, okay, grandma pushed grandpa into the water, grandpa's now drowned. When you first arrive, you don't know if uh, grandma pushed grandpa or did grandpa just fall in right? Um, is grandpa wrapped up in chains with a cinder block attached to him? What is going on with grandpa? So when you first get out there, you don't know what you have. You don't know if it's an accident. You don't know if it's a uh, criminal intent. Um, so you must document that area uh, exactly like you would a crime scene. Um, I can't remember how much we went over in the last class about uh, the documentation portion uh, of, of crime scenes. Um, but if you think about it like this, if you uh, walk into a room and there's a dead body lying in the corner and uh, you, you run outside, you call the police and the, the police show up, um, the first cop that arrives is going to secure that crime scene, right? He's going to block it off so nobody else goes in, okay? The next person to arrive is going to be the crime scene technician. And the crime scene technician is going to step into that room uh, but they don't want to disturb any of the evidence in that room. So as they walk in, they're going to walk around the, the perimeter of the room first. And every couple of feet, they're going to stop and they're going to take pictures all different directions. Okay. And then they're going to walk again along the wall and they're going to stop again another five feet and take 100,000 pictures. And they're going to walk five more feet and take another 100,000 pictures, right? Until they get all the way around the circumference of that room. Why are they doing that? Well, the main reason is, is so they can uh, recreate that crime scene at a later date, right? You can't leave the dead guy in the corner of the room for court to happen, right? So now we've caught our bad guy and now we go to court and we have 12 jurors sitting in the stand and we have the judge sitting up there and we're gonna say, oh yeah, come to the crime scene. We're gonna walk in, dead guy's still in the corner and now you can see where all the evidence was laid can't do that, right? So we need to be able to document where every piece of that evidence is so we can remove it, preserve it, and then recreate that scene for a jury. As soon as the courts realize in your area that you have side scan ability uh, with these searches, um, they're going to expect the same type of search that a crime scene technician would do with your, uh, with your marine unit. Um, so if we, we kind of think about it this way, when, they, when you find a body right now, um, the crime scene tech comes out and most of the time they're not a diver. And so they've spent years and years and years and years and years of, of training, probably have masters and PhDs and all this kind of stuff. And blood and bodily fluids as, as evidence and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, all this forensic background, that all that forensic training goes out the window when they arrive at a water scene and they can't die, right? So now all of a sudden you, um, as the diver, become the forensic technician, right? 
instantaneously ordained as you are the forensic technician. And so now it is your job to go down and document and recover all of this evidence. But you might not have all the training that it takes to do that. Uh, but what you can do is do the documentation as well as you can. And SideScan will help you do that. So again, if we get back to that crime scene technician walking around the perimeter of that room, taking all of the pictures, uh, right? So then they can take a measurement of the room and from each picture, say uh, two pictures have a hammer in it, right? And that hammer was used to bash the guy's head. Um, so from the distance in this one and the distance from this one, they can triangulate where that hammer is and then they can replace it in a 3D space of where that hammer was and how it was positioned. Okay, we can redo that for a court. So SideScan does the same thing. You can gather all of that same evidence, right, at, with a side scan as the forensic technician did with the camera. So we can recreate that crime scene. And how you're going to do that is using the sector search. Okay, and so as we see, as um, you can look at my mouse now instead of me jabbering, um, but you have uh, the bearing of the vessel coming in, right? We're gonna cross the crime scene, and then we're going to uh, hang a left. And as we uh, hang that left or, or turn to port, right? Then we're gonna turn sharply to port again, and we're just going to kind of create this flower type thing. And as it moves, you will eventually go all the way around in a circle and then the, each time you go around, it will overlap the other and you will form a 360 um, of the area and you will see all of the anomalies within that area from multiple different views, right? Multiple different views on multiple different transducers. And so as you're coming up, right? We're seeing port and starboard from this particular bearing. But as we're going across this way, we're seeing it from a completely different side and possibly a completely different transducer. So you'll have multiple images to be able to lay out um, and triangulate uh, the objects from. So you can very accurately recreate your crime scene using this method. So I hope that helps you out um in your crime scenes again most uh, agency i know know of today uh they'll do their parallel search they'll locate uh, as soon as they locate they send their diver down and they raise the body right but you're going to come across that one that uh, that one homicide case that you really should have documented um, and it doesn't take that long, you know, we're talking about an extra maybe 15 or 20 minutes in the water of going back and forth across this uh, object before you, you send a diver down. So that's a sector search. I, I hope you, uh, you use it, at least try it out. I know many of you uh, talk about on the forum, you're, you're building your, your mannequins and your dummies. Go ahead and throw one of them out, do the sector scan search and, um, or the sector search and uh, tell me how you do, and post some images. All right, so uh, now let's get into marking targets. How do we mark targets? How do we accurately mark targets? And then how do we mark a target so our diver can actually find the target once it's marked, okay? Uh, I, I would ask you all to raise your hand, but I can't see anybody. I'm just staring at my face here in the computer. But uh, I, I know many of you will, will be raising your hand uh, to this. How many of you have gone out and conducted a search and you mark an anomaly and then you send your diver down and 15 minutes later, your diver comes up and says, there's nothing there, right? How many times have you uh, marked a target, you anchor your boat, you dive down and you search and you search and you search and then finally, you, you, you locate uh, that anomaly, but it's not where you thought it was, right? Um, so yes, electronic marks are great, right? And we still need them. 
but you also need mechanical markings. So what's an electronic mark and what's a mechanical mark? Okay, so an electronic mark is when you have your software and you see the object, let's say this wheel type object here. So we see the object and I go up and I select my tool, this thumbtack tool, right? And I come down here and I double click uh, on that target. It's gonna create a little blinky box around it and it's gonna highlight it with a red crosshair. And then it's gonna show up over here on my chart plotter as a little red dot, right? That's all electronically marking. It's marking it, it's giving me the, the latitude, the longitude. I can get a lot of information from this electronic mark. E, I can even sail away from it and then select it like we have here. And then this range and bearing tool will direct me on how to get back to it, right? So I can leave and come back tomorrow, set it into that range and bearing, and it will direct me right back to my mark so I can find it again. But no sooner than I anchor and I drop my diver in the water is he's going to come back up and say, there's nothing there. I can't find it, right? So how do we go from finding it on the surface of the water to allowing our diver to find it on the bottom of the water, right? Or on the seafloor. We use mechanical markers. And so we're going to talk about mechanical markers, how to make a decent one. That's relatively easy. And then how do we set in place our mechanical markers? I believe first, though, we will go into the electronic. So let's talk about electronic markers first, and then we will get into mechanical markers. So if we um, see our top image here, this is an image. Um, sent to us by a couple of friends out in the uh, Kwajalein Atoll, and I believe this is a, a, a World War II wreck uh, of a Japanese freighter. And when they searched and found this ship, right, they were using a pretty wide range and the towfish was pretty high and there wasn't any real danger of, of hitting the actual ship, but they wanted to get some closer views of it with a higher frequency. But they were scared they were gonna hit the ship right? They, they didn't know how close they could actually get to, to the boat without hitting it. And so what you can do is you can electronically mark the outer edge of the ship. And then as long as you're traveling on the same bearing that you did when you first marked, you can stay off of those marks. And so you'll be able to see it on your chart plotter. If we can see the dots here, those are all of our marks. And if we have three in a row, right, we can stay off to one side and we can scan the side of it. So that will allow us to get closer and closer without the fear of hitting it, right? So we can range in, and if we range in, that makes the object appear larger on our screen. And the more we range in, the higher the frequency we can go, the higher the frequency, the better the resolution. So we can get, really in-depth, detailed images of these giant ships without being scared of hitting them. So electronic marks are very good for that purpose. And what they typically look like is if we have this wheel type object here, we can look down here and we have a little red crosshair. And so that's normally what an electronic mark is when you're visualizing it in your waterfall. When you're visualizing it in your chart, it's usually going to appear as, a, as a, a dot or a little crosshair. Some software sets have marking ability and some don't. You wanna make sure you have the ability to mark your targets. It doesn't do you any good if you can't uh, relocate your target, right? Say you find a shipwreck, right? And you mark those grid coordinates and then you leave and then you come back and you send your diver down, you can't really find it and then you have to side scan all again. Well, if you're running your side scan and you, you select one of these little red dots, you can just travel right back out to it. So make sure whatever system you get has the ability to mark targets. We can see on, on our lower one, another way of, of marking, it's going to have this little blinky box. And so as you're passing over the object, it will start blinking at you to, to help you get out of that zoned feeling that you're gonna get staring at that firewall for hours at a time. A little blinky box will come and you'll be like, oh, 
That's the other object I marked on the last pass, right? So make sure again, you remark it on this pass because you'll see that your electronic mark, if you're, if you're coming up and you mark, and then you're coming down and you mark again, it's gonna look like they're different, right? They're gonna be different. We're gonna talk about why that is uh, here, here in a second. But it, on your second pass, coming from a different bearing, your electronic mark will appear to have moved. It will appear to be different from the, from the mark before. So make sure on each pass you do an electronic mark. And the mechanical marks. But before we get into mechanical marks, we're going to explain why those uh, the electronic marks appear to move. So we're going to start looking at this top left hand image here, and we can see our boat, and we are moving forward in the water. We're moving this direction, right? Um, so the green area is our uh, starboard history, and the red area is going to be our port history. That's the area we've already covered. The yellow dot is going to be our anomaly, and as we're moving, you have to remember your towfish is going to be behind the boat. It's on a cable. You're dragging it through the water, okay? So in, uh, we'll call it uh, 20 feet behind the boat for right now. Uh, we can say we're in, say, 50 feet, 60 feet of water, something like that. And we will say we are looking out 100 feet of range. And so this red area here will be 100 feet. The green area, even though it's cut off, will be 100 feet. And we're, we're roughly, uh, say, 20, 20 feet behind the boat is where the towfish is. So even though your boat is way up here, your towfish is going to be back here. Okay, and so with that, the, the object is going to be off to the side of the towfish, not off the side of your boat. However, your GPS is on the boat. So when you mark that target, you are marking the boat's location. You are not marking the object's location. Now, some systems will have what's called layback. And if you fill out that layback uh, window correctly, it will mathematically calculate and change your GPS to that object's location. If you don't do layback, you will be getting the location of the boat. You'll still be getting this offside distance, right? But you will not be getting this forward back dis distance. So the object will appear right here on your screen rather than back here on your screen. Because again, GPS is on your boat. Your towfish is behind your boat. If you don't do layback, it, it's going to be off. Most people don't do layback. It's really uh, one of those complicated things that if you can do it, you need to learn a little bit more and, and practice it to get layback but when I talk about mechanical targets, um, if you're not uh, in giant, vast areas, you don't really have to worry about layback and you can still locate your target. So again, if the boat is moving forward, your towfish is behind you. And so when you mark a target, it's going to look different on your screen because your GPS dots aren't going to line up. That means when you turn around and you come back the opposite direction on a different bearing, your towfish is still behind your boat. See, uh, we have our boat here. Here is our anomaly. We're still at 100 feet of range, so our target is about 50 feet away. The towfish is still 20 feet behind us. And so if we were to mark again electronically, our mark would be here at the boat. Our first mark would be here. Our second mark would be here. So when you pass it, even though you see it on your screen, that mark is going to be different unless you have your layback set up exactly. So that is one of the main reasons that you um, send your diver down and they can't find it. It's because you didn't approach the target on the exact same bearing you did when you marked it. Now, if you uh, 
uh, marked it here and you came back the following day with your diver and you followed the same exact bearing and you stopped where you marked it, then your diver would, go, would be able to dive down and see the object. But if you say, uh, come up from this bottom left-hand corner, or you come in from the bottom right-hand corner, any bearing change at all will change where that electronic mark is going to be comparatively to the physical um, location of your actual target. So how do we set up mechanical markers, which are actual physical markers that go in the water with a buoy on the surface for your diver to be able to locate? Hang on, we got a question. How does the software know the set uh, back of the target because of the cable length? Okay. So layback is more than just cable length. There's a couple of things that play into that. Um, layback is going to calculate where your GPS is, right? And then it's gonna try and calculate where your towfish is. And it does that a couple of different ways. One of the first settings of your uh, layback is going to be the distance from where the GPS is to the portion of your gunnel, gunnel being the top edge of the boat, where the cable is leaving the boat. Most of the time that's gonna be your transom, sometimes it's gonna be the beam, but wherever your GPS is to where the cable is leaving the boat, that's gonna be your first measurement. The next measurement is going to be the freeboard. The freeboard is from the gunnel to the water line, to the top of the water, right? Where the water's hitting the boat. Your gunnel, the, again, the edge of your boat, is always above the water line. If not, you're sinking. So where that cable is going off the gunnel and into the water, um, that distance will be your second dimension, and that is called freeboard. The next uh, thing is going to be your cable length versus cantonary. The cable length is going to be from where the cable hits the water to the actual towfish. And then you have what's called cantonary. Cantonary is that curvature of the cable. Well, why does the cable curve? Well, you have water movement coming in and you have surface area of cable. The water is going to hit the cable and push it just like a sail and it's going to cause it to curve, okay? And so you'll end up with this curvature of cable going down to the towfish. So you need to know what your cantonary is, you need to know the length of your cable, um, and you need the freeboard and then the distance from the GPS to the gunnel. Your um, software should ask for each one of those, um, and when you add them in, you will actually watch that GPS mark change. Um, with our software, you can add in uh, the, all of those at, at a later time. You don't have to add them in right when you do it. So you can, um, what's called ground truth your GPS at a later date. Um, it's best to do it all at the beginning uh, before you go out to actually do your search. But yes, anytime you raise or lower that towfish, you're going to have to go back into your layback settings and change the amount of cable um, that gets added or subtracted from that length uh, to change your, your layback. I hope that answered the question uh, without getting... <laughs> Uh, a little too technical. All right, so let's talk about uh, laying mechanical targets. I, when I'm out doing a body recovery, I don't always do layback. I think um, with the distances we're working in, um, you don't necessarily need to do it if you're going to do mechanical targets. And what again, what I mean by mechanical targets is an actual object that you're putting in the water that has a rope tied to a buoy that is floating at the surface, okay? And what I normally use as my mechanical target or uh, my mechanical marker is, is something uh, large uh, without being too heavy, something that can be seen on side scan, but you can still manipulate it on the deck of your boat. If you just use a buoy anchor or a regular anchor off a boat, it's going to be kind of difficult for you to see on the side scan. You want to be able to scan and see where that uh, weight is and your anomaly so you can see the distance between the two and get a bearing from that. 
what I like to use are dog kennels or crab pots. However, if you use a dog kennel or a crab pot, make sure it's raw metal. Don't get uh, the one that's covered in plastic or has that plastic coating on it because that doesn't always appear well um, in your side scan imaging. Remember, more dense materials are brighter on the screen. So I usually go down in, uh, to West Marine and I get the, the cheapest crab pot I can buy, right? It's made out of chicken wire and it has no plastic covering on it because those things are really bright on your screen. And that's what I will use for the weight for my buoy. Um, so then I have a, a uh, what's, what's called a fender buoy. And for those of the, who don't know what a fender buoy is, you can look them up. They sell them all over the place. It is a usually a, a white buoy. They're kind of long and it has two holes on either side. And you usually tie it to your gunnel and then the, the lower portion of your freeboard. So it protects your, uh, your fender from the dock, right? They're usually elongated, again, with two holes in it. I use that one because that big hole, I'll throw a rope through and then put a weight on the other side. So I have a crab pot on one side, then the rope goes through the hole, and then I have a weight on the other side. And the reason for that is when I'm dropping in my crab pot, I want the buoy to stay directly above the crab pot. I don't want it to uh, sail away I mean, because if you're if you have longer rope than the water depth you're in, your buoy's going to be way over here, your crab pot's going to be right here. I want that buoy to sit right on top of that crab pot. So I'll drop the crab pot and I throw the weight and I set the the buoy in the water. And then the the weight will go out and it will tighten up all of that line and then the weight will sink and hopefully your weight's not heavier than the buoyancy of the, of the buoy. The buoy will float and the weight will allow that rope to move up and down. And so even in tidal areas, your, your buoy will stay directly above your crab pot. So you, you know exactly where that is. And now let's talk about how to lay that actual marker. So that's my typical marker that I use. And now how do I put that marker in the water? This is kind of funny because I know y'all have done this and or you've seen it done before. And it, it's kind of funny to watch. When you are side scanning, you, most of you realize that the tow fish is behind you and it's going to be off to one side. So if we, if we look at this again, that upper left-hand picture, the tow fish is about 20 feet behind the boat um, and our anomaly is about 50 feet off to one side of our vessel, right? And so the distance from the back of our boat out to our anomaly um, is going to be roughly uh, 70, 80 feet, right? And how many people, when you, when you uh, mark that on your boat, you tell the guy on the back of the boat, throw the marker, and he sees where it is, and you run out and you try and throw this marker 70 or 80 feet to try and get it out to where the target is supposed to be. People do it all the time. You don't have to try and throw it out. Nobody's going to be able to throw that weight 70, 80 feet and get it accurate. Instead, look right here where I have my white dot. It's right off the port transit. So as you're scanning, again, towfish is 20 feet behind. The anomaly is 50 feet out. I will drop my marker right off the port quarter, directly off the port quarter. Okay, and then when I turn around, when the boat turns around and now we're sailing this way, again, I didn't change my towfish, right? My towfish is still 20 feet behind my boat. And if I kept my line spacing right, this distance going from this dog leg to this one, um, my distance here should be about the same too. So I again drop my second marker right off the port quarter. So this one is off the port quarter and this one is off the port quarter. If you lay them as soon as you see that anomaly appear on your screen, they should be relatively the same distance apart off of your anomaly and in a straight line. Now, in that straight line, you can now take your boat and you can sail between point to point and you can see on your side scan, crab pot, body, crab pot, right? And you can measure the distance between crab pot to body. 
You can make sure that these crab pots are far enough out that it is not interfering with the crime scene that is down there, right? I hear and see a lot of people that want to put the crab pot on top of the body. Yeah, that can be that can get pretty bad, right? We don't even want to get into the grossness of what can happen if you put a crab pot on top of a decaying body. But if you keep the these two crab pots or uh, your markers away from the body, you're not contaminating your crime scene, and you are creating a bearing line and a bearing indicator uh, for your diver when he goes down. So now if you have a decent diver, he can go down this buoy line and he can traverse from buoy to buoy, right? He can, on in the air, right, in land, on the boat, rather, he can shoot a bearing from one buoy to the next, and then he can take his compass, he can follow that, uh, that buoy down and then shoot that same bearing, swim along the bearing, and the body should be somewhere between uh, buoy one and buoy two. If your diver can't follow a bearing, um, some people can't, it's pretty easy to do, but some people can't. Um, and so you can take a rope with two D rings on it, one on each end, and you can hook this one uh, to this buoy and that one to that buoy and let the rope sink. And so as the rope sinks, it will go from one buoy to the next, then you can send your diver down one buoy, he can find that rope that's across the seafloor and he can follow that rope to the body. So that's how I mark targets, right? I make sure my buoys are set outside of the, what I would believe to be the crime scene. I don't throw them, you know, <laughs> towards the object. I keep them away on purpose. I calculate the distance based on uh, my dog leg, right? So this is going to be so, so many feet away and this one's gonna be so many feet away, but as long as my dog legs are accurate or near accurate, they're, they're going to be there. And then at the surface of the water, you'll see these two buoys floating, right? So now you can just point on any diver that comes up, right? Because uh, uh, I know some teams, there is marine units and then they have a diving unit. Why they're not together, I don't know. Uh, it's just, it floors me that there's always a boat unit and then there's a dive unit. Why, why not just have one unit? But anyway, so now you're bringing your divers out to go dive and you can say, okay, the, the object, uh, your, your anomaly, your target, your body, um, is going to be directly in the center of those two buoys. Very easy to find. So that's why mechanical targets, in my eyes, beat out electronic targets. However, I do use both of them, okay? I'm going to electronically mark it so I can get in the rough area of where I'm going, and then once I'm out there, I'll mark it 100,000 times electronically, and then I go back in and I mark it mechanically, and then I will verify that mechanical marking by using the side scan. So again, I side scan back and forth along this bearing to see and measure the distance from this buoy to this buoy and from the buoys to the body. If one is too far away, all you have to do is come in and grab that buoy and drag it along the bottom and bring it closer. Scan it, look again, scan it, drag it, you know, and move those buoys closer and closer to your anomaly um, until it's where you need it to be for your diver to locate. So I hope that gives you a, a, a good idea of how to set mechanical targets. And again, mechanical targets can be anything uh, you want to make them out of. Just make sure that the weight um, is easily seen on your side scan. So test them out before you go buy a hundred of them, right? You can uh, make sheet metal fins on anchors. Uh, I've seen all kinds of different things from dog kennels, to, again, to crab pots, to five gallon buckets that, have, that are filled with concrete. Um, I've seen all kinds of different, different ways to, um, uh, to make these markers. Do I have any questions on markers? If so, just drop them in the drop box there. And let's move on. Um, so let's see what that looks like underneath the water. So we, here we have our body again. I believe I went over this guy in, uh, in the last video, so we won't go over him again except for how he's placed, okay? And so here is our first marker. Our boat was traveling. Uh, we would be traveling up at this point. 
right? And so if we're traveling from the bottom of the screen to the top of the screen, our boat would have been right here next to that marker. Our towfish would have been right here. And we would have been looking off to this side when we saw the body. So once we um, see the body, then we drop the marker, right? And then we come up, we turn around and we come back this way. As we are coming down this dog leg, again, my boat would have been here, my towfish would have been back here, and it is looking out and it sees the body and I lay my marker. So I would have two markers with the body somewhere in the middle. If the, the more practice you get with laying mechanical markers, the more you'll get that body right smack in the center of those two um, uh, buoys. Um, that now you're probably looking and you can see this trail here, right? It says buoy drag. Uh, so what that trail is, is when we were doing this um, particular search, uh, we came down this way. And as we were coming down, we ran into a boat that had the media on it. And they absolutely refused to get out of our way. We were telling, we were trying to communicate to them that uh, we had a sonar on board and we were running sonar and all they were yelling back to us is they had a right to be there and they were gonna film. And I was like, I don't care if you film, just get the hell out of my way. So finally we stopped and we had a small conversation with them. We put them in a certain location so they could film everything they wanted to film. And um, then we had to, uh, as we turned around, we ended up drifting and my guys dropped the buoy up, up there off the top. So we scanned again, we found it, we grabbed the buoy and we dragged it back into location. Um, and so that's why that drag mark is there. When you uh, lay these marks down, you should be able to see when you scan again, um, the rope from the buoy. And both ropes, as they are coming up, should uh, diminish at the same place, okay? If they diminish at the same place, that means they're both coming up to the same waterline. Now, when you scan, and if they don't diminish right around the same place, something's goofy is going on, so make sure you get a couple of um, uh, different views of it. Um, it could be that uh, one buoy has a longer rope than the other, and so it is moving versus the other one. Um, so again, they should diminish at the same place. It doesn't matter if they're one's here and one's there, that they still will. Um, so our electronic mark was right here. And why was our electronic mark way up here? If you remember back a few slides, we were talking about um, the boat being here and the towfish being here. And so when we marked it, I came over here and I double clicked on the actual body. However, our GPS put it up here because it was in line with the boat, right? Not with the towfish. So that is why my uh, e-marker is here, our electronic marker, and then you have this uh, yellow box. So this yellow box uh, on our software, it's a blinky box that comes up and it blinks to let you know on your next pass that you're coming up to the object. Again, you can see the, the shadow here of the rope used for our buoy. And now this was quite a long time ago and so uh, I didn't quite have all the tools. This was uh, back in 2009. Um, and, and back in that day, we, we just used uh, regular uh, buoys with small little uh, anchors to them. Um, and that's why you can't see it on this one. But, but it is there. It's where that rope matches the ground. All right. So, um, but I'm telling you, strategically placed markers uh, will better aid divers and in, in locate that target and you will get there a lot quicker. Your divers won't be as fatigued when they get there. Um, they'll have a plenty of air left to actually process the crime scene because they didn't spend an hour searching uh, for the body once you told them it was right there. So that's mechanical targets and making and marking. If there's any other questions on marking targets, please place that in the comment box. 
All right, so now let's talk a little bit about out-of-the-box searching. How do we search areas that you can't get a boat into um, or you possibly wouldn't think or uh, imagine a towfish going to, right? And so the first one I'm gonna talk about is a stream of pictures on the uh, left-hand side of your screen. And so what this is, is this small little lake, uh, pond really, um, that we weren't allowed to put a motor in. And so it's very hard to do side scan off of a boat that you can't put a motor in because how are you keeping that straight line? Well, how I typically do it is I will run a rope from one shore to the other shore. And I'm gonna kind of draw a little box here on my screen, right? And so I will first, at the very top of the box, I will put a post with a rope and then I will tie that across to the other shore. And then we get in a boat just like we're on here, a little rubber raft, we throw all of our equipment in, I tie the tow fish out, um, and then I have somebody drag me across to the other shore. In the pictures, it just happens to be uh, Tim Kennedy. This is when we are on uh, Hunting Hitler, season one, episode eight, it's on the History Channel. You can feel free to watch that. I had to uh, plug the History Channel because anytime I show their images, they make me uh, mention that that's where it's from. Uh, but anyway, so, so yeah, I had uh, Tim Kennedy help me out with this one. So he drug me across, and then once we got to the other shore, uh, we moved this marker, or I mean this post with the rope, down, and then he drug me back. And then we moved this marker down, and then he drug me back. And so we basically zigzagged across that pond. We had no motor, right? We, all we had was a little rubber raft. I've done this thousands of times, uh, thousands, probably hundreds of times, uh, off a, a canoe, a kayak, rubber rafts, you name it. As long as the boat will support you and the weight of the towfish, um, you can use this method of search. Um, it can be uh, used in still water, moving water, rough water, doesn't matter, um, as long as the, the whatever you can put into that body of water will hold the towfish um, and hold up its weight. Um, a, a real easy way to do this is you can also do it where you're not manned, right? There's nobody on the boat and you just use the cable, especially if it's a dangerous area, or you put two kayaks and you put a board, a two by four across, and then uh, from that, the center of that two by four drop the fish. So it's basically uh, two outriggers on, on, on a vessel that's holding the tow fish. And then you just pull those kayaks back and forth across. So that's one method of doing it. In areas that uh, like retention ponds, where um, the, the water's really shallow and you can't get a boat in, but it's still very big and it's impossible to search a, a huge giant retention pond with just a couple of people relatively quickly. Um, and you could get all covered in mud, everybody's nasty by the end of the day, all that kind of stuff, um, because you're down underneath in your hands and knees. And it's much easier to strap that towfish to your shoulder, right? Leave the computer and the cable on shore, strap the towfish to your shoulder. The uh, person with the computer is going to be the one monitoring, and you walk back and forth across the pond, right? Retention pond, something shallower than your neck, right? So you can still breathe. And you can walk back and forth um, and, and still view, usually just one side because the other transducer is buttoned up against your leg. Uh, but either way, you can still see. And then the guy on shore will let you know when you cross something, you say stop, and then you'll back up and you'll go forward. And then as you're backing up and going forward, he can see the imaging on the screen and then he can direct you, okay, the, the object is 15 feet to your right, so you just move 15 feet over, go back and forth again, and then again, yeah, you're, now he's three feet to your right, and then you can just keep going that, and they can direct you. But that's an easy way to search a retention pond where you can't get a boat in um, to go back and forth. Uh, next way, ditches. I hate searching ditches, and all the time people are throwing handguns in ditches, um, especially after a thunderstorm or hurricane or, or just the, the, the ditches in your area don't drain, right? Uh, but you have miles and miles of ditches. 
and you can't find uh, or you don't want to crawl on your hands and knees in this nasty, mucky, muddy mess to find the handgun that somebody chucked out the side of a car, right? Uh, so what I use uh, for that is a shopping cart, right? And that's why I got the picture of the shopping cart there. Uh, you can throw the computer in, uh, a battery, the cable, everything into that shopping cart, and then lay a two by four across the top, uh, weight one side of it, the same weight as the tow fish. I usually throw a cinder block on that side and then hang the tow fish off the other side. And I just push the shopping cart down the street, right? Tow fish in the ditch. So as the tow fish is in the ditch, I have it at a very small range. Um, and then any object we come across, we can say, okay, there's an object. And then you can just reach in once or twice to pull out those objects rather than crawling on your hands and knees through a ditch to uh, locate that handgun. Just another way to use a tow fish. Think outside the box, right? Think outside the box. Um, use your bean, okay? I had a, an old mentor of mine would always say, use your bean, bro. And an old, old hippie laid back guy, use your bean, bro. So just think about the area and use the system in a way that uh, allows you to get the tow fish in the water. Uh, when it's in the water, all it needs to do is send out that sound signal, okay? Uh, this upper image here is a way to use the tow fish in dangerous situations or in areas where uh, you're going over like a cavern. The water is far down below, but the shore is uh, has cliffs on it or, or something like that, or it's extremely fast moving water that you don't want to get people near, right? Um, and how you do it um, is if you follow my mouse, again, upper right hand corner of your screen, you're gonna see two posts. These posts can either be physical posts or they can be people holding, right? But what it is is this uh, purple line here is going to be a taut line, um, a tight line. It's going to be tied from one post to another post. It can be two cars. Um, it can be two people. It can be two trees. It doesn't matter. You need a very tight line going across that body of water. And then you're going to put a snatch block, uh, which is a pulley. For those who don't know what a snatch block is, it's a pulley that can go over a, a taut rope. And then you have a secondary snatch block that you're going to run the cable of the tow fish through, right? You still have to be able to raise and lower the tow fish. And so the tow fish will have its own pulley. And then on either side of the pulley um, or the snatch block, you will have a rope going to either side of the shore. And so what it is is your sonar operator, this guy looking over the computer, um, he's going to keep the tow fish at the proper height off the bottom. So he is going to use the cable in and out, right? As this guy and this guy are pulling that cable back and forth across the water. So the taut line supports the weight of the tow fish, right? This guy is going to raise and lower the tow fish in the water to keep it with the dynamics of the seafloor. And again, this guy and this guy will move that tow fish back and forth across. And just like uh, when I was using the pond and the uh, rubber raft, you will move those poles back and forth so you are zigzagging across that area. So hope that makes sense and hope that solves some of the issues uh, of how do I side scan or how would I search this specific area. And if you just look at the area, kind of think about it for a little bit, come up with a solution that will allow you to manipulate the tow fish and move it back and forth. That's all you gotta do, raise and lower, move back and forth. As long as you can do that, you should be able to get that tow fish into any environment, right? We've uh, load the tow, lowered the tow fish and uh, ran it back and forth through um, uh, storm drains that were filled. We just basically, we ran a rope 
through the storm drain. We tied it onto the front of the towfish. We tied it onto the back of the towfish, and we drug the towfish through the storm drain, uh, storm drain pipe to do a, a search of the storm drain. So there's all kinds of different ways that you can use a system. But again, just use your bean. Think about it and, and work your way through. If anybody has any questions on, on certain areas of how to do an, a, an unfamiliar area to you, or uh, you come across an area where you're not quite sure how to search, all you gotta do is shoot me a text. You can go onto the forum and ask, and uh, one of us will get back to you and kind of help you out with that type of a search. Because there, there can be some really crazy search areas. Ah, looks like we are, we are done. So closing thoughts. How long have we been? Oh, let's see what time it is. Oh, we are right at two hours. Um, so in closing thoughts, uh, again, I'm going to say this, these closing thoughts every time uh, we, we do a program because I think they're, they're very important. Uh, the first one is know your sonar. Uh, I don't care what sonar you got. I mean, I would prefer you have a Marine Sonic course because ours is the best um, but but know the sonar you have right train with it use it anytime you can don't just pull it out of the box every nine months that you have a body recovery right um, make sure you're using it so when that time comes you're not calling me at three o'clock in the morning saying why isn't my toe fish working right? Well, you haven't pulled it out of the box in nine months. That's probably why, right? Make sure uh, that the software is up to date. Make sure that everything about it is in good working order and that people on your boat know how to use it. So train with it. Put it in your yearly and even uh, monthly training schedules. I, I know people don't get on the boat all that often. Some of you are part-time units and things like that but just know the equipment, okay? Then find its limitations. Make sure you know what it can and what it can't do, okay? Know how far you can set the range, know at what settings uh, a body will appear uh, the best or a ship will appear the best or if you're looking for metal, what color it should be on. All these different things, find its limitations. Figure out in training, the best way to run your system, whether it's off the bow of the boat, off the stern of the boat, the beam of the boat, uh, all these different things, find out in training before you need to use it, okay? Next is don't hide your knowledge. Make sure if you know how to use it, you are telling others how to use it. You don't want to be one of these guys who you're the only person who can touch it. Nobody else is allowed to handle it because the only time it's ever gonna be used then is when you're on vacation, right? And then you're gonna have the guy who doesn't know how to use it uh, look dumb in front of other departments while he's fumbling around with it on a, some big major crime scene and he's calling you in, uh, in the middle of the night on vacation, right? So make sure you teach others how to use it. You don't be the one hiding the information, okay? And on the flip side of that, Make sure if you're not the one who is the primary user of it, that you're asking questions, right? Don't be the guy who sits in the back of the boat and talks and says, uh, Johnny on the spot over there, he'll, he'll always be the one running it. I don't need to know this information. I'll just sit back here and jibby jack. Yep, make sure that you're up there asking questions while Johnny on the spot is teaching the lesson, okay? Uh, Last but not least, don't take shortcuts, okay? Make sure you're doing your precursory searches, right? You're going out, your towfish is high, wide range, going over an area so you're not hitting something below. Then when you're doing your actual search, you have the proper spacing, you have the proper range, you have the proper height, the towfish is moving, your coxswain is following a straight line. You adjust for set and drift, both on the boat and for your target, right? You're gathering the correct intel. You're going back and you're calling dispatch. What was the make and model of that uh, 97 uh, Ford Expedition again? 
Um, and then, then you're looking up the specifications for it. Make sure you're gathering all that information. Then when you locate your object, you're not the one who says, oh, there it is, jump in the water and pull it up without documenting your scene, right? Make sure that you're taking 90 degree turns instead of circles. Make sure that you're exiting your search area. I think I forgot this one. You're exiting your search area before you turn around and then re-entering your search area in a straight line. That's a good one too. You don't want to turn around in your search area. You want to exit your search area, turn around, come back in your search area in a straight line. So that way your towfish is always head on in a straight path as it's looking off to one side. And then uh, of course, keep it up to date. Uh, keep the software up to date, um, keep everything about it, your knowledge, uh, how you train with it, all of those, your certifications, any, anything you need, keep that, that all up to date. Um, if you have any questions uh, or you need a system or um, you want to learn more, uh, my number and my email are down below. I'm also on Facebook, so you can uh, look me up on Facebook. Again, my name is Reagan Lipinski, and I'm the training director for Marine Sonic. We also have a Facebook group called the Technical SAR Side Scan Sonar Group. Again, that's the Technical SAR, S-A-R, Side Scan Sonar Group. Uh, we have a bunch of great individuals on there, a bunch of famous names too, that uh, are experts in the field. They have a, a lot of good and, and nice equipment. Um, they've been doing it for uh, decades. Come ask questions, come post your pictures. I wanna see uh, what, what you're imaging out there. Um, it is a closed group, so you'll have to ask to join. Uh, most people, as long as they work in the field of side scan sonar, uh, we will accept. Um, but again, if you, you're sharing images on there, we don't expect to see those images other places. We talk about sensitive material um, in that group sometimes. Um, so it is a closed group. Uh, but come on, join us, um, ask questions, uh, figure out the technical side of things, and learn. You never stop learning, and me, as long as I've been doing this, I'll, I'll, I always learn something new. I hope you all have a good day, good rest of the week, and uh, go on to the forum and let me know what class we should do next. All right, thanks a lot.